like we're starting off small. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, let me just give you a brief uh, introduction to uh, Alan Mills. Alan Mills is a lawyer with the Uptown People's Law Center. He's been a veteran attorney that's been involved in prison-related issues for years. He handles both cases for individual prisoners and cases that have to do with what are known as class action lawsuits, where uh, well, he'll tell you more about that. Making making it a better situation for a whole class of people, i.e. prisoners, um, in a nutshell. Um, and I'll just tell you very briefly how this came to pass. Alan and I were talking on Facebook and talking about different prison-related issues. And uh, I brought up to him that I wondered if Uptown, being such a hotbed for activisms of other kinds, might also be a place where we could perhaps bring about a core of people that were very interested in, maybe outside the legal circle, finding ways that they can be involved in bettering the lives of prisoners. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over the mic to Alan. And the mic is really intimidating, so bear with me. Um, so, I work at the Uptown People's Law Center. For those of you who don't know, we're around the corner at Sheridan and Montrose. Um, we, do, we do do prisoner rights litigation, but we are really a community-based law center. So, we started off um, not founded by lawyers, but founded by former coal miners who came to Chicago, uh, began to get black lung disease, and couldn't get help. So, they banded together and started agitating and organizing and found a lawyer uh, to take on some of those cases, picketed the Cook County Hospital, public aid, demanded benefits, demanded health care, and ultimately started um, solving people's legal problems, first black lung and then a lot of other things. So we're very much out of this neighborhood, and we were started back in about 1975-ish. Um, and it really started when they found a volunteer lawyer to come in and sit in somebody's living room uh, once a week to talk to whoever came through the living room. Um, we hired, we rented an office over on Wilson Avenue, and when I say we, it's before I was here. Um, Wilson and Magnolia, and we were there for several years. Uh, we had part-time attorneys for about 15 years. By 1990, um, I came up there in 1991, and I've been there since as the full-time lawyer. We do mostly landlord-tenant work. Uh, we do a lot of social security disability for people in the neighborhood who are disabled and trying to get their benefits from the government and being denied. But we quickly discovered, not surprising, that poor people also are the ones who have been in prison. So we began to get letters and telephone calls from people from the community who went to prison and they had problems inside prison. Maybe they got beat up by a guard. Maybe that their mail was being censored. Maybe they weren't allowed to practice their religion. Whatever it was, we began to get letters first from people who came from uptown. We represented them in their evictions or their moms in their evictions. And so we started taking some of those cases on. And it grew because nobody else is doing this work in the state of Illinois. The Uptown Law Center is the main people who actually litigate on behalf of prisoners. And I see a hand, so I'm going to say right now, feel free to interrupt at any time because I've got a lot to say, but I'm sure you have questions. So, you know, throw your hand up and ask. Yes? I just wanted to know the people that you started representing and they were writing you letters. Were they already out of prison? Or? Nope. These were people writing us from their jail cells who used to live in Uptown, went to prison, had a problem. We were the only lawyers they knew, so they wrote us. And we started responding. Um, we ended up taking on a big class action case uh, way back in 1982, uh, claiming that prisoners who were in segregation, including Joe Gancy, who grew up in Uptown, or a little north of Uptown, um, weren't allowed to go to the law library, we couldn't get any access to the courts, so they couldn't bring any claims they had whatsoever. We litigated that from 1982 for 18 years, won three or four different times in the trial court, and ultimately our wonderful Supreme Court um, changed the rules and said that neither of our clients had ever had the right to bring this case in the first place, threw out our entire 18 years of work, said all of it was for nothing and threw the case out. 
for some reason, that sound did not turn me off to prison litigation, but instead got me really involved. Um, so sometimes from failures comes big things. So the Law Center group, not the people, we're still really small. There's only four of us there. Um, but in the number of letters we got. The good thing about doing access to the courts case is that you are in contact with all the jailhouse lawyers in the state. So we started getting letters. We currently get 125 letters a week from prisoners throughout the state of Illinois. And you name them, what do they raise? What kinds of questions do they raise? They raise anything. They, some of them are sitting in Cook County Jail saying, I have a terrible public defender. We don't represent people in their criminal cases, so sorry, we can't help them. But it's anything. It may be we've got crappy medical care. It may be that I'm severely mentally ill and nobody will treat me. It may be that I got beat up by a guard. It may be that I'm trying to practice my religion, but they won't give me a Bible or they won't give me a Koran. Uh, they won't give me my diet that I require because I'm a vegetarian. You name it, we get those letters. And we started doing some cases. Originally, we were doing a lot of cases by prisoners who were beat up by guards. But we're really small, and there's, you know, there are almost 50,000 prisoners in the state of Illinois. Are we going to be able to take 50,000 cases on? Obviously not with only four people. <laughs> yes, you have a question. I have a question. The person that they threw the case out there, are they still yeah. in jail? Um, well, one of the, it was actually ended up being on behalf of two people, one from the old Robert Taylor Holmes, one from Uptown. The one from Uptown tragically died of uh, liver cancer before he could get out. The other one is still in prison, yes. He went in at the age of 16 in, I think, 1975, and he's still there. Are so you funded by the federal? No, we're not funded by anybody. <laughs> um, we get some foundation grants. If we win some cases, sometimes the other side has to pay us, and we beg for money. So that's how we get our money. We're not funded by the state. If you take federal money, actually, if you take federal money, you can't represent prisoners. That's part of the reason that nobody else does this in the state. Um, so, we're sort of the only ones that do this work on any kind of big scale. Did you say you don't take criminal cases? We do not take criminal cases, right. We only deal with people who are guilty and they're stuck in prison and we don't try to get them out. We just try to make sure the Constitution is followed while they're in prison. What do you mean you don't take criminal cases? You mean you wouldn't take anyone that... Uh, or well, we won't try to get them off. We'll, we'll take murderers. We represent a whole lot of murderers. It's just once you go to prison, we don't really care why you're there. doesn't matter why you went to prison. You still have constitutional rights. They still have to be honored. So we represent everybody from somebody who's in for possession of marijuana to somebody who murdered several people. And I've got both. I've got clients who did both. And you don't get them out of prison? You don't even... Nope, we don't even try. That's not our game. Ours is all about how they treat you inside prison. If they get out, fantastic, but that's not what we're for. So the Illinois prison system is horrible. So what I want to do tonight is talk a little about the Illinois prison system, some nationally, but mostly Illinois, how we got there, what it means to be in prison right now, and at the end, I'm going to talk a little about what people can do about it who aren't lawyers and can't bring class action cases. So I'm going to start with a story. Tams Correctional Center is a supermax prison. Supermax prisons we'll talk more about, but for right now, you just have to know you're locking yourself 24 hours a day. Danny Johnson went in um, as an 18-year-old, uh, committed a murder. When he was very young, he tried to escape. So you can see he's got green stripes on his shoulders. That's because he's a high escape risk. He'll never get out, probably, of segregation. He's got a life sentence. So he's probably going to sit by himself in a cell for the rest of his life. After 10 years at TAMS, on April 21st, 2012, he wrote us a letter saying his mother had just died, saying thank you very much for letting me know about my mother, because of course the prison system doesn't bother to tell you anything. And this is one of the hardest letters we've ever got. This will be my last letter to you. I'm going to kill myself. He had been practicing for a week, took a plastic bag, tied it over his head, saw how long he could last, wrote out a note to the guards saying, don't resuscitate me. And that night, went to sleep with a bag over his head, fully expecting him to wake up. He did. Um, they did revive him. He went into a coma. Spent two days, I think, in a, in a, in a coma. Um, but eventually came out and is currently in Pontiac, still alive, but also still in segregation. 
interestingly, you as soon as... You never tell someone that you're going to kill yourself. If you're serious about it, you just keep the <laughs> Well, that's right. And he, he very carefully timed his letter so that we wouldn't get it until after his death. Oh. Because he knew that if he wrote us beforehand, we would be on the phone down there to the warden saying he's going to kill himself, stop it. Oh. So he didn't send it until that night, knowing we wouldn't get it until he was after his death. So... So they found him, I and mean, you know somebody did their job, checked, and saw he was unresponsive, and got him alive. Again. Are the prisoners in Illinois? I know down south they'll throw you in jail and throw away the key. Are they just as bad up here? Uh, yes, and let, we'll talk a minute. <coughs> Hang on, and we'll get to some sentencing stuff. Okay. Um, ironically, even though he just tried to kill himself, once they put him into his cell in Pontiac, they gave him all his property in a huge big plastic bag. <laughs> That's the level of mental, and, and they wouldn't let me see him for a week because they said his mental health was too delicate, oh. um, that he couldn't deal with any outside stimulus. At the end of that week, they stick him in a cell all by himself, give him a plastic bag with oh. all his possessions in it. So that's the level you're dealing with in the Department of Corrections. On the one hand, you get trapped, it's so absurd. Um, but think about how bad a cell has to be that you're willing to put a plastic bag over your head and never wake up again. And think about how hopeless it is. I mean, he's now been in for 20 years, all in segregation. And he's still a young man. I mean, he went in 18, so 20 years, he's still 38, 40 years old. He's going to be there probably for another 20 years in segregation because he's got a life sentence until he dies. He's there. So is it irrational to say, I don't want to live like that? I want to come out? A lot of people would say no. There's a question back there. Yeah. I was just, you're saying segregation. You're talking about administrative segregation, which is solitary confinement? We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. I've got a whole lot of stuff on solitary. Yeah. I've spent a lot of my life fighting about solitary, so I've got lots to say about it. But first, let's talk about who's in prison and why they're there. Up until, up until the mid-70s, this is the um, rate of incarceration, not the numbers. I, no, sorry, this is the numbers of incarceration. Um, up until the mid-70s, it had been relatively flat the entire history since really the Civil War. It goes up a little bit. There's a little drop in World War II because, in fact, a lot of judges said you could either go to the Army or go to prison. Um, and a lot of people chose the Army, not surprisingly. But in general, it's been pretty flat. And there's a whole bunch of literature out there trying to figure out why is the prison rate exactly the same. It didn't even go, it went up a tiny little bit during the Depression, but not a lot. So it's been a slow but steady growth over the time. And there was a lot of debate about it. And then by 1977, the debate became irrelevant because it was no longer flat, but instead it was almost vertical. So currently in the United States, we have a rate of incarceration which has never before been experienced anywhere in this country. We are simply incarcerating far more people than anybody ever has even thought remotely possible before. We are off the charts. Internationally, it's a different story. This is Western Europe, those countries we like to compare ourselves to, the other so-called civilized first world countries. And in Europe, there's lots of debate. Why is there such variation? Denmark and the United Kingdom, it's almost, the United Kingdom is twice the incarceration rate of Denmark. Why should Great Britain have such a high incarceration rate? Lots of studies back and forth. None of them mention the United States. Why not? Because when you put the United States in there, wow, there's no difference at all in Europe. So not only are we off the charts for anything we've ever done historically, we're off the charts for the Western world. And in fact, we now have the highest number of people in prison of any country in the world, as well as the highest rate of incarceration of any country in the world. South Africa for a while was, was competition with us back when they had apartheid. Uh, Russia was competition with us for a while when they had the gulag system actually running. Um, but we are far and away number one now. Uh, the statistics that's always quoted is the United States has 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prisoners. We lock up numbers of people that are just unheard of anywhere else in the world. So we are in the midst of an experiment of how many people we should lock up that hasn't ever been tried anywhere in the history of the world. That huge number of people locked up does not lie evenly across the population. Whites, I'm sorry, blacks are about 12% of the population in general. They are 40, almost 
of the people in Cyprus. So the black population is vastly overrepresented inside prisons. Interestingly, that gap between blacks and whites doesn't disappear, even if you're a college graduate. Now, the number of people that go to prison drops dramatically if you're a college graduate. But the gap here, the ratios between the red line and the white line, red being black men and blue being white men, it's the same. Same ratio. So going to college is not guaranteed if you're a black man that you're not also going to go to prison and that you're going to be treated differently than everybody else. The other really interesting thing here and the really scary thing here is among high school dropouts, we're now incarcerating more than half of young black men who don't graduate from high school by the time they're 35. And among all young black men, the chances are if, if we continue to go on the route that we're going on, it will be a third of all young black men alive today will go to prison or jail before the age of 35. A third. That says something about this society that we're willing to live to criminalize that huge a chunk of a racial population of black people. It sends a really important message as to what kind of racial equality we really have. Yes? It's uh, modern slavery. It is. It's modern because they always try to uh, make the black man look bad, you know, and it's working. That's right. And, and the really scary thing is now, if you see a young man, black man walking down the street, you say, oh, he must be a criminal. In some sense, it's true, because if he's a high school dropout, most of them will go to jail. Yeah. So it's, it sends that message. Young black men are criminals. Well, my, uh, my right. son is, has a master's degree. Mm -hmm. Him and his wife both have a master's degree. He lives in Georgia. He was late for work, and he was driving through all white suburb in Georgia. They stopped him and wanted to see his drive. He's got a nice car, yep. dressed up like a businessman. What are you in this neighborhood for? Let us see your ID. Right. Criminals are actually young black men. slavery. You got them. And actually, using that word is interesting. The 13th Amendment abol abolished slavery. What most people don't know is there's a second phrase there, except in the case of those people who are convicted of a crime. So it's exactly modern slavery. The 13th Amendment exempted prisoners. So we can still have, we still have slaves as prisoners. Yes. I think it was Michelle Alexander that gave the statistic that there's currently more African American uh, men in prison than there ever were in slavery. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, and anybody's interested in this racial question, Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, is a must read. It's 300 pages of all those kinds of facts. I've yeah. got it down to three slides, but if, you, <laughs> if you're interested in it, that's where you look. I wasn't going to read you 300 pages, but every page on there has fascinating information. All right, so who's in prison? It's not murderers and rapists. I don't think I have the slide, but yeah. Uh, murder and rape has stayed pretty even. It's way down here. It's grown up a little bit, but murder and rape are way down here. So prisons are not full of rapists and murderers. There hasn't been a big upsurge in murderers and rapists. Uh, in Chicago, while it makes a lot of press, the murder rate today is lower than it was 20 years ago, lower than it was 30 years ago. What's happened in Chicago is it's become very concentrated. In two or three neighborhoods in Chicago, it's skyrocketing. But in, in uptown, by the way, despite what you may read on, on certain websites, um, is not one of those neighborhoods that's impacted by huge numbers of workers. Who's in prison are drugs, drug users. Drug users are the ones in prison. We saw the vast increase from 1970 on in the total prison population, this is the huge increase, exactly mirroring it, in drug arrests. So we've had millions and millions of people who have been arrested for use of drugs. And those people in prison are not the big kingpins. They say, well, there's so many more blacks in prison because they commit all the crimes. Not true. Not true. If you look at who uses drugs in America, that's the blue lines. Whites used about 72% of drugs, Hispanics about 10% of drugs, blacks maybe 12% of drugs, and everybody else accounts for 2 or 3%. All the surveys show that, no, that all drugs, including, by the way, crack, which you would never know watching TV, are used equally through all racial categories. White people use more crack than black people. White people use more cocaine than black people. White people use more of any drug you can think of than black people. Then you start looking at who's in prison for drugs, and that's the red lines. 
and it's exactly the reverse. 55% of the people in prison are black, and about 22% Hispanic, and about 18% white. So it's exactly the reverse. It has nothing to do with who commits crimes. It has to do with who we choose to enforce the criminal laws against. We choose to enforce them against black people, and therefore black people are the ones that end up in prison. It's really simple. So when people tell you blacks commit more crimes, it's a lie. Illinois has had very much the same. This is the chart of Illinois' prison population. Uh, we were about 10,000 when I started doing this work in the late 70s. We're now just a hair under 50,000. I think we're at 49,500. Um, projections are that by, um, I think, two years from now, we will break the 50,000 or 52,000 mark. At the moment, we have beds for 52,000. Um, but as you'll see in a minute, that's really a misleading statistic. Um, in terms of the way that Illinois was designed, the prisons were designed, they're designed to hold about 30,000 prisoners. So we already have vastly overcrowded prisons. So what did we do? Illinois has a long history um, of prisons. Our, I'm going to talk about the maximum security of prisons first. We have three in Illinois. Menard Correctional Center was built in 1870. It's an old prison, still in use today. Pontiac, also a maximum security prison in Pontiac, Illinois, about an hour, two hours south of Chicago, uh, was built in 1971. Our brand new prison in Illinois for maximum security is Stateville, opened in 1925. Um, this is a roundhouse. I don't know if anybody read any Jeremy Bentham, but the idea was you have a guard in the middle who had complete, a complete visual uh, was able to see every prisoner all the time, but the prisoners wouldn't know when they were being watched, and therefore they would be on their best behaviors all the time. Um, it was a silly idea in the first place, and as we'll see in a minute, it's now become absolutely meaningless uh, because actually the guards have no visual ability to see into any of these cells anymore because they've changed the way the cells operate. So that's that was, and that was really when I started. That was the main three prisons we had in Illinois. Um, one of the things that happened early on, at the same time that this explosion happened, is we had some riots. Particularly Attica being the most, uh, Attica in New York, a prison, uh, where prisoners took over the prison for almost a week. Um, they were negotiating, and at the end of the, well, before the end of the negotiations, Governor, then Governor Rockefeller um, ordered that the guards and the National Guard and the Army and everybody, all kinds of law enforcement, storm the prison and take it back. Um, it was bloody because before they went in, uh, all of the assaulters um, were told that the prisoners had actually slit the throats of several of the hostages that they had taken, which was completely untrue. Um, therefore, they went in with a really bad attitude. 37 people did die uh, in taking over, including a fair number of guards that were being hostage. All of them were killed by gunshots um, fired by the snipers that were taken back to prison. And that was, that was really the, op the, the event. The pr prison reform and the way people, we were treating prisoners on the map, on the agenda of the country. And from that, some good things started happening in prison briefly. We had to start having programs to figure out what's going to stop people from coming back in. One of the things that works absolutely best, hey, well, fly is part of my show, uh, is education. Education and mental health treatment. That's what keeps people out of prison. Vocational education, getting people ready for jobs, reduces, this is how much. Uh, is the recidivism rate decreased by each of these programs. So vocational ed education drops it by about 15%. Cognitive behavioral therapy, a particular kind of mental health treatment, uh, drops it. Having a real job inside where you actually make something drops it. Drug treatment, since all those people are going into prison for drugs, not surprisingly, if you actually provide them with drug treatment, it stops them from going back in again a second time. And pure academic education actually drops people's uh, recidivism rate by about 5%. So all of those were put into place after the Attica riots and right at the same time that the prison population was exploding. And here's the explosion that happened right after all, right after all that went in a different version of it. So my contention is we made a, a huge mistake right here. We were starting to do good things with, with some prison programs, trying to figure out what stopped people from um, coming back into prison and, and trying to figure out what to do with the system. And then we abandoned all that. And we started packing more and more people in, and we ran out of money. So the immediate thing was to stop all those nifty programs we were doing, and to build more prisons instead. So instead of three prisons, 
We now have 23 prisons spread all over the state of Illinois, uh, from a correctional camp up in the northern Winnebago and to Tam's Correctional Center, now closed, thank goodness, um, way down at the southern tip. If, if you think of Illinois as a triangle, that's the Mississippi River, that's the Ohio River. Tam's is like 10 miles north of Cairo, which is right down at the point. Uh, so it's about as far away as you can get from Chicago and still be in the state of Illinois. So we have prisons spread all over. This is Pontiac up here we just showed the picture of. Stateville is in Joliet right down there. Um, and Menard is also way down here. Uh, this is St. Louis up here, so it's about an hour south of St. Louis. This is what those F house cells and most cells looked like back in 1978. Open bar, single bunk. They weren't really comfortable cells, to say the least. They're a little it was sort of livable. In addition to building all those new prisons, we doubled them all. So what used to have one monk down here, now has a second person living in there, which makes it really crowded. We also got rid of those programs. So Stateville used to have, has a whole section back end of Stateville, as does Menard, uh, as does Pontiac with classrooms. They're all empty. 3,000 prisoners at Stateville, one teacher for all 3,000 of them. They gave out 30 GEDs the last time that I've seen the numbers, and they now have zero college classes. So once you get your GED, there's no more education you can get whatsoever at Safeco, uh, Menard, or any of the maximum security prisons are out of luck. Some of the other prisons still have some vocational education. They do more GED than this. Only one of those 23 adult prisons, Danville, still has any college courses at all. Anything. So education is essentially gone. Prisoners were built. They were horrible places to live. We knew from industrialization, we knew from the 1920s, that when you start packing people into urban areas, a bunch of sociological and psychological research on this, you pack people into small places, you destroy their family ties, you get violence. That's what happened in the prison system. We doubled up people's cells, we cut all their programming. Instead of being out of their cell all day, going to a job, going to classes, going to recreation. They were sitting in their cell driving each other crazy with the tool. So people started rebelling. This is a picture of a food strike where everybody threw their food out of the, the galleries. One of the few things you have control over is the food that they serve you. So you throw it out there. It's, a, it's an interesting protest. Um, so what did we decide? Not that we had made a mistake. Not that it was wrong to pack all these people in there and give them nothing to do. We decided that all of a sudden prisoners had become really, really bad people. So we got rid of those nice bars that you saw on the doors. Now you had double cells with solid steel doors. So now you can't even see out of the cell. And by the way, these are not air-conditioned cells, and they didn't have windows, you may have noticed. So now you've got a solid steel door, two people living in, no window, no ventilation. It gets really hot today. It's hot outside. You think it's hot outside? Or in your apartment, you don't have air conditioning? I guarantee you, on the top floors of Menard, five stories of Menard, um, it's probably 110, 120 degrees in some of these cells. Three years ago, a man baked to death in his cell in Menard. Um, literally baked to death. Every year, we lose two or three people from heart attacks, dehydration, that kind of thing. Because it's hot. It's really hot and airless in these cells. Asthma is. Um, prevalent throughout the prison system, and you can imagine not having any kind of fresh air at all it doesn't help that disease at all. In the middle of the security prisons, we converted every space we had into living units. This used to be a warehouse. It now holds 300 people. It's in Vienna Correctional Center. Vienna Correctional Center is another one that was back, built back in the 1920s. It used to be a model prison. It was a minimum prison. People used to come from all over the country to look at it. They had a farm around it. It's in far southern Illinois. Lots of farms around it. So prisoners would go out and work on the farms. They had an emergency medical technician training program. So in the town, if you called up the, an ambulance in the middle of the night, it would be a prisoner who came and took you to the hospital. Um, it was in town. used to have baseball teams that came in and played the prisoners. It worked great. All that's gone. Um, it's packed full of people. They converted this warehouse into a dormitory. There are now 300 people living in a big open space like this. Um, but they have this problem because, think of your typical office, it has a men's room and a women's room. Maybe two urinals, maybe a urinal on a stall, um, and that's what's serving these 300 people. There wasn't a shower there. There's just two, four stalls for 300 guys. 
It's a mess. Upstairs, they converted another space. There are seven showers upstairs that they have to share with these 300 guys. There's another 300 guys living upstairs. So it's a mess. The department is so broke, they couldn't fix the windows in this old warehouse. Summertime, birds would fly through. Birds are not house cleaning. Then it started getting cold. And, you know, open windows are okay in the summertime, but in the February, it gets cold. So the department still didn't have any money to fix the windows, so they simply put boards over the outside of the windows. So for a year, they went through in the summertime with open windows that everybody could call the bugs and birds could fly through. In the wintertime, no ventilation at all because they simply had no light at all, no natural light. They put in these nifty fluorescent things. And for other guys living like that. That's one of our class action cases saying that the Adam Correctional Center is now so badly run um, that it violates all standards of decency and it can't be that way. I think we're going to settle that case and they're going to get these guys bathrooms and showers and um, recreation and the things they need in order to actually live there. The other thing we did is start building the Supermax prisons. I mentioned the Supermax before briefly, uh, but we really went to town. Illinois built one. Um, this is located in Tams, Illinois. Uh, you can't quite read the sign on this picture, sorry. It says, Tam's home of the first Supermax prison, and underneath it says, a nice place to live. <laughs> Which I'm guessing was meant to refer to the town, but it doesn't say that. It says the Supermax is a nice place to live. Uh, after the Tribune published this, they began to get a lot of really weird letters saying, no, it's not a nice place to live, and they took the sign down, but it was there for like three years. Oh. We got a picture. Um, and, and 38 states. Built supermax prisons. Supermax prisons are designed from the ground up not to have any human contact between guards, prisoners, and another prisoner. So you can sit in your cell all day long and never actually see anybody, never touch another human being. You could be in a supermax prison for 10 years and never have skin to skin contact with another prison, another, another human being ever. When guards move you, they were supposed to put on big leather gloves. There have to be two or three guards physically keeping hold of you all the time. When you go to doctor's appointments, the guards have to stay there and keep their hands on you as the doctor is examining you. Uh, no jobs, no religious services, none of that. You're in your cell. 